is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Networks. Actually, it's Ghost to Ghost AM. And I issue you fair warning, some of what you're going to hear tonight is going to scare the hell out of you. So if you're alone on the highway driving, at home in a dark room, it's up to you. Stick around and, as you heard in the first hour, it's going to get rough. We'll get back to it in a moment. Here comes the first candidate. Okay, all right, it says you asked for it. Do you have my permission to post the attached photo on your... But as long as you don't release my address or phone number. I'm a student of religious demonology and help the local clergy when dealing with cases of possession to keep my skills sharp. I spend a fair amount of time in cemeteries interacting with and photographing spirits. And here's a favorite from my collection. I was walking in a cemetery last night when I sensed a spirit telepathically beckoning me to follow it. I did so. And I was led through the cemetery to a freshly dug grave. Freshly dug. I took a picture and turned to leave when the spirit told me it wasn't ready. And when I took the picture, uh, that is to say when I took that first picture, so I recomposed the shot and waited for the spirit to give me some kind of cue. Shortly, I began to see something through the viewfinder, but it simply didn't re register completely visually. It seemed to register in some other region of the mind. So I took that as the cue, and I snapped the shutter. I waited for the flash to recycle and took a third photograph and left the gravesite to finish the remainder of the roll of film. And what he has sent me is one of the photographs on that roll of film. If you will check my website, I suspect Keith will have it up there pretty quickly. If you have a ghost or spirit photograph, you may send it to me tonight and we will act with dispatch and get it up there. My web address is www.artbell.com. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. What the heck was that? Uh, what, what do you mean? What the heck was what? Oh, I'm on. <laughs> yes. Hi, Art. Right, how are you? This is Michael from Manhattan Beach in California. Yes, Michael. Well, my story goes back quite a few years. Uh, my uh, ghost story was precipitated by a, uh, a world event, which I was part of. Let me take you back a few years. When I was just 17 and out of high school, I enlisted in the Navy back east, went to Samson, New York for boot camp, and from there, through some um, testing that they gave, they uh, sent me to uh, the premier radio school the Navy had, which is in Benson Springs, Pennsylvania. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I've heard of it. And it was the A1 class of the Navy radio school. It was a converted hotel and country club. And um, we learned code, we learned procedures, and we couldn't graduate, which was the word for all the Navy uh, information that was disseminated out of Washington, uh, was uh, sent at 18 words per minute. But uh, out of Bedford Springs, you couldn't graduate unless you copied at least 30. And the top of the class is 3.8 and uh, above. Fortunately, I was one of those, received the rating and third class rating uh, upon graduation. That's pretty good. I can't do 30. I can, I can do on a good day 20, but not 30. Oh, 30. I, we used to do uh, 30 was uh, the beginning. Uh -huh. You used to copy at least 40, 50. Yeah, you've got, I know there are certain crazed people who can do that. Anyway, uh, from there at that time in, 19, uh, in 1944, uh, there are no more fleet assignments or submarine assignments. Everybody was assigned to the, uh, to the amphibious grouping. Yes. And from there, I went to Fort Pierce, Florida, and was assigned to um, an amphibious group. And what the radio men did at that time was to, um, with the LCVPs that carried the troops ashore, 
There was a, uh, a coxswain and a gunner mate and a radio man. Yes. And that's what we were trained for. Yes. After a few weeks there, I was assigned to an APA, and we went to the Pacific. Right. Uh, carrying on a bit, uh, the the uh, my ghost story was precipitated uh, from a day that I'll never forget. Not a, probably not a week or a day goes by that I don't think about it. Uh, April the first, Easter Sunday was the day we uh, invaded and landed on Okinawa. And uh, we were assigned uh, to uh, carry the troops uh, in waves, as you know, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Yes. Uh, to shore, yes. which we did. And uh, it was kind of scary, but we did our job. And our our ship, our APA, carried a second wave across. And by the time we were finished that day, uh, we got back to the ship and hoisted the LCB, uh, LCBPs aboard the ship, and uh, we finally hit the sack about uh, close to midnight. Well, this is where my my ghost story begins. About three o'clock in the morning, you know, we were all tired as hell, and I think my when my head hit the pillow, uh, we I fell asleep immediately. And about three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I know it was around 3 o'clock, because I looked at my watch when it happened. Uh, nothing startled me. There was no noise. I just woke up, sat up in my in my bunk, and there was, oh, I, I forgot to preface something. One thing I hated about the air is I couldn't, I couldn't handle the smell of the diesel exhaust. It's kind of like nauseated me. Yes. I never got seasick, but I just couldn't handle that odor. Well, anyway, when I woke up that morning about 3 o'clock, I woke up to this sweet perfume smell, and I, I, you know, what the hell is going on here? One of the guys must have was taken a bottle of perfume and dropped it or some damn thing. But then I realized oh, that smell was familiar. You remember how your old aunt or your grandmother used to uh, uh, splash that uh, body powder over them, the bathing uh, 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 powder after they took a shower and I the do. smell so sweet and, yes. and flowery? Yes. Well, that's the smell that I had, and I had my, my favorite, it was my favorite band smell. My Aunt Melanie, back east, God bless her, I, I could never forget that smell. And that's, that's what I was smelling, the, the odor of the, of the diesel fuel uh, was gone. And, and the air was odor was was, uh, was uh, uh, prominent. Yes. And after smelling the weather, realized what was happening. I looked at my watch. It was around three o'clock, and I fell back to sleep. And that was that was the end of the incident. And about two weeks later, I got a letter from my mother, who told me that uh, my aunt Melanie had died uh, on Easter Easter Sunday. In the, the first, afternoon, April the first, and uh, it was devastating to me. But uh, I, you know, thought about it quite a bit, and then a couple of weeks later, I realized, yes, what the heck is going on here? She said she died Easter Sunday in the afternoon. Yes, and I contacted my mother, wrote her, and asked her exactly what time she she passed away. And when you did the time conversion. It was exactly at that moment that I woke up when I smelled the, the, the powder, the sweet floral scent of, of the powder that my Aunt Melody used to put on her body. I appreciate the call, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And what he just told you is very, very common. And it implies that when one passes to the other side, there is at the very least a period of time when you get to visit with or be near those you love. It's been in just about every movie I can think of that has dealt with ghosts and death. And I guess most recently, uh, the movie with uh, Robin Wood, you get to console or you get to feel or you get to be with or you get to leave a sense with those who you love. And I guess it doesn't matter where in the world they are, does it? On a ship uh, near Okinawa with all those time zone changes or anything else. Because over there, 
there really is not time, nor is there space. So you're moving in a different realm. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. I am. Um, I just want to tell you I really enjoy your show. Thank you. And I'm going to tell you about um, our ghost story. Uh, well, one night my son was in his room and he had a friend, and they called me in there. They were yelling. And I stood with the manor, and I went in there, and there was this shadowy figure underneath the bed with the red eyes. And red red and, eyes? Uh, and it scared the hell out of me. Under the bed scary. with red eyes? Under the bed with red eyes? Yes. Yeah, and it's like shadowy. And I was so scared, I called my husband in there, and he went in there, and he said, what the hell is that? And I said, I really don't know. And then my son just informed me that he has seen this again. Uh, he was in his room one night, and the shadowy figure went by, and he's also seen it again at my mother's house in the, in the, like in the shadows and he threw a rock at it so I, I think we're going to be doing a lot of crying in the near future because I, I have no idea what that thing is I, I personally don't want to say it he threw a rock at it? yes and he said it just kind of sat there and yeah, that kind of stuff really scares me Ugh. now one can imagine almost anything but one has got to has, has got to admit that when it's red glowing eyes it's not a good message no i would immediately think the devil and you know I, i'm a christian and i believe in praying you know because things like that you don't want one hanging around you well you sure as hell don't want them under your bed i don't want them anywhere <laughs> i appreciate your call sir wild card line you're on the air hello hello art how are you this morning i'm uh or, or, or should I say this evening? Uh, this, this is this is Patrick in uh, in Fairfield, California, an old uh, uh, Air Force brat myself. Yes, sir. I uh, just want to uh, first of all uh, give you all my best wishes to you and your family. I, I hope that all things get worked out soon. Oh, it will. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to uh, also tell everybody that, that we have a new uh, Usenet uh, group that's uh, that's just been oh it's two weeks old I think called uh, Alt. Or ALT binaries paranormal. So uh, in, anybody with good ghost pictures, uh, we, we've got lots of great orb pictures up there and stuff. And all right, right. you know, I've been collecting them over the years now. I've got some really incredible photographs on my side. There, there's, uh, it, it's an inter interesting phenomenon. I, I, I certainly can't uh, say what the heck it is, but uh, um, one, yeah. one wonders why so many times the camera catches what the eye does not. Anyway, do you have a story? Yes, yes. I, I wanted to relate to one of my many ghost stories that I share with my uh, my friends on uh, uh, alt folklore uh, ghost stories. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another great group. Um, it's, it's about an experience I had uh, while I was uh, working towards my degree in parapsychology at the sleep lab in, uh, at Sac State, Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were doing, doing an experiment this uh, particular night. We were mapping the uh, mapping the stages of sleep uh, uh, using Kirlian photography. Right. It was, it was eventually uh, written up in the Journal for the Psychophysiological Study of Sleep. So in other words, uh, the Kirlian image changes with the state changes, of sleep? Uh, yeah, it changes well, that's, that's not, only, not only through the REM period, but between REM and non-REM. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it was the first time it was ever done. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we, it was it was a pilot program. We didn't have much funding, and uh, it, what it what it required was that my my assistant uh, Mike stay in inside the anechoic chamber with the uh, with the sleeping subject. Right. And uh, and had, he had to advance the uh, film manually right. in, in between exposures uh, when I would uh, cue him with a little light from the experimental room. Gotcha. And this particular night, it was about four o'clock in the morning, and. Uh, um, I, I, could, I could actually hear two, two people uh, snoring in, you know, over the intercom, but Mike had fallen asleep himself. Bad. <laughs> I was wondering how the heck I was going to get him awake without uh, waking up the other person. Yeah. Uh, but we had already gotten some pretty good exposures that night. But uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, I hear, this, uh, hear this movement uh, over the intercom and uh, Mike uttering this, this low curse. And uh, I was thinking to myself, oh, geez, there, there, there goes the entire night, you know, if he ends up waking up the person uh, yes. prematurely. Yes, you're ruining the experiment. Exactly, yes. exactly. And uh, <laughs> as, as it turned out, uh, it was going to be ruined anyway because uh, he, he yelled out over the intercom my name, Pat, and he goes, my God, you won't believe this. Uh, she's walked right through me. And I, I hear the uh, the heavy door of the chamber being opened and Mike's footsteps coming around the, uh, the, the corner to the experimental room. And he goes, look, look at that. And, and he's grabbing my arm with about 500 pounds of pressure. And they're in the wall 
uh, from, from the experimental room into the chamber comes this kind of misty looking uh, stuff. And uh, by the time it was halfway through the wall, uh, just past the uh, EEG, the, the old brass model 6 EEG we were using, uh, was kind of, uh, it, it solidified into the, the apparition of, oh, I don't know, about a 60, 65 year old woman. Wearing a, a flower print dress and, and she was just like, like floating with, uh, oh, about ankle length experimental room. <laughs> I looked over at him, you know, but both of our, our jaws are dropped, our, the hair on the back of our neck are just sticking up. I'm, I've got goose yeah, like well. mine is now. Oh my <laughs> God. I, I mean, it, it was it was an incredible sight. And, and so when she passed through the shelving on the left hand side where we store all the EEG paper, just passed through as if as if uh, it were nothing, and she 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 never looked over at us or anything. But we immediately went around over to the left where there's another hallway. It was kind of a big U-shaped complex on the on the base floor of the psychology building, and we were expecting her to come through what would be one of the small little experimental rooms next to our experimental room, and then come out into the hallway, and she never did. So we went back around, and and sure enough, there she goes floating back into the sleep chamber, and then. We, we indeed went over to the right hand corridor where she came through the anechoic chamber and disappeared out the outside wall. <laughs> did the uh, did the Kirlian photography that you were doing happen to catch any of this? Um, actually, uh, it, and unless there was an, an an exposure being made during that moment, we wouldn't have known. And and do you and, think and is, it, is it reasonable to ask you whether you think the kind of experimentation you were doing, monitoring sleep? Krillian photography, something very unusual, might have, in effect, uh, opened a door that allowed all of this to occur, or what's your sense of it? Well, she, she uh, showed herself a second time, Art, but the, the experimental parameters during that time were a, a very uh, very traditional sleep type of uh, uh, experiment wherein we were measuring the temporal regressive reference of dreams uh, uh, de de dependent upon the effect of alcohol and body temperature. Yeah, but it may be that the very study of that sort of unconscious uh, Oh, oh I, absolutely. I, 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 w I would have to tend to agree with you on that, yeah. I appreciate the call. Hey, thank you, Art. Thank you. Bye-bye. I could not have handled that. Not at all. From the high desert, this is Ghost to Ghost AM. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I, I've been listening to your show going down the road. My hair's been standing straight up, goosebumps the whole night yard. Oh, it's been quite a night. Uh, I got a, I got a ghost story for you. This, uh, I wouldn't believe it, but uh, this, this uh, little girlfriend of mine was, was literally seen exactly the same thing I've seen. This happened back in the uh, late '70s down in Redondo Beach. Yes, sir. Uh, out in California. Uh, I was up for the weekend. I was, I was in, in the Navy. And we'd uh, rode up to the store to get, get a case of beer, go over to a friend of mine's house and uh, uh, do a little party. It's just, just, just a, you know, right about sundown, you know, you know, it's uh, just starting to get dark. We're going down the road on my bike, both of us totally straight and sober, and uh, seeing this thing and like, like a like a black kind of like tape right across the road in front of us. And, Really moving, you know, faster than I, any any person could run. I mean, it was though running like a human being would run. You could see the motion. No, not really. No. So more like a fast moving floating object. I I, I would probably say that, yeah. All right. Anyways, it, it took off uh, up in this grass field where the power lines run through, and I, I turned up in there. 
Let's try to catch it. Well, I, I started catching up with it, and all of a sudden it spun around, and it, it, it looked like a skeleton. And it took off back the other way. So I uh, got, uh, got my bike turned around and chased it back across the field, across the street, up this little alley by this park, and it, it ducked around this uh, corner of this building. May I ask a question? Yes, sir. Uh, why would you chase a skeleton? I don't now, know. If I saw a skeleton, I'd be going the other Art, a contribution to your program. This experience took place 20 years ago, and I swear I get goosebumps when recalling this incident to this day. It was the summer of 81. I was a typical 17-year-old. I remember that. I'd sneak out after my parents were asleep, I remember that, and drive around with my friends looking for girls, of course. Not that we would have had the slightest idea what to do with them. Very slim chance that they would have given us a time of day, but I digress. After getting back home at about 3 a.m., I got out of my friend's car in front of my parents' house, waved goodbye to my buddies, turned around to head towards the front doors. I looked around. I was quite startled to see a man standing in the street between me and my parents' driveway. He was backlit by this a long trench coat and a stovepipe hat. Additionally, he was standing next to an older style bicycle. This is an extremely odd clothing choice, considering this took place in the summer heat of Phoenix. Now, Bear in mind that we had just driven up the street directly over the spot where he was standing, and he was not there. I was scared because I assumed that anyone out of, uh, out this late, you know, or early in the morning, as you look at it, it was most likely up to no good one way or the other. Obviously, you no, know, it didn't, and quite frankly, I had a bad feeling. In an attempt to ascertain his intentions, I asked him, can I help you? No answer. I repeated, can I help you? No answer, he just stood there. Kind of cocked his head to one side as if trying to figure out me as well at this point. I'd had about enough and I began to look around for something to defend myself with, unfortunately. He stood directly in my path. I couldn't get to my parents' house with no alternative. I began walking toward him with my hand out as if to shake his hand in a friendly gesture. I got within a few feet of him before breaking into a full sprint, and I simply ran right past him. And I noted that as I did, it was very, very cold as I ran past. I didn't look back. Now, the next morning, my neighbor, who worked the graveyard shift, no pun intended, poked his head over the fence to ask me what was that all about in your driveway early this morning? While I was somewhat relieved to discover that somebody could cooperate the experience, I was deeply troubled by what he said next. He said, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but after you took off running, that man got on his bike, pedaled a few yards, and simply vanished. Well, my neighbor has been to, uh, to uh, take a drink every now and then. The possibility of his being sincere and sober resulted in many a sleepless night. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hi. How you doing, Art? All right, sir. I'm calling, uh, listening to you from 105.1 in Las Vegas. You bet. K -C -C. Tony. Yes, Tony. Uh, one day back in 1984, I was getting drowsy, so I decided to take a nap. Right. After several hours, I woke at about 12 o'clock at night. It was a particularly dark and creepy half of the night. I had my window cracked when a noise rustling in the leaves drew my attention. I proceeded to look out of my window for a few minutes and saw nothing in the mostly blackened outdoors. I decided to go back to sleep. But for some reason I couldn't, and that's when I heard the fluttering kind of sound. That's when I decided to go outside and see what it was. A fluttering kind of sound? You mean like a bird or something? Yes, yeah. but it was in the leaves. Okay. Carefully, that is, I, I, so I grabbed a butcher knife, creeping down my stairs to the side door, 
of a third story, story house. I rounded the corner to the garage, expecting a prowler to pop out from one of the many oak trees. And having to use your butcher knife. That's right. I continued onward, and I saw with, with the aid of a neighbor's dim patio light, a thin five-foot-high body of some kind with a gigantic head scurried from behind one tree onto the next tree. It went behind this tree as well. Let's slow this one up a little bit. A body with a gigantic head flitting between trees? Yeah, it was scurrying. Scurrying. It was kind of scurrying. All right. And it went from behind one tree onto the next tree, and it was behind this tree as well. Not getting a great look at it, I proceeded towards the tree with my butcher's knife. I got to the, tr the oak tree, I prepared for the worst, knowing whatever it was had to be there according to all the laws of physics. Right. So I jumped past the tree and there was nothing there. Whatever it was, it had disappeared. Needless to say, I got no sleep that night. What do you think it was? What do you think you had encountered? Possibly a demonic entity. Uh, when I was looking at it, it was backlit as well. But it, it looked like it was completely black, whatever it was. Well, I'm glad for you that you didn't have to actually plunge a butcher knife into a demonic entity. Well, that's not the end of the story. Oh. There's one more quick clincher. Yes. Three days later, I found a cat of mine that had been missing. Right. And it was completely degutted. Huh. It was degutted. Completely degutted. And it had a razor sharp cut down its, down right the center of it, and it had been completely degutted. You're sure that in some sort of psychotic, unaware, unconscious moment, you're sure you didn't degut your own cat, right? I'm absolutely sure of that. And you connect the two events? I kind of do and kind of don't, but uh, you never know. You never know, and uh, uh, horrible as it was to have a begutted cat, a uh, better little feline than yourself, eh? Exactly. Could have found you out there. You got it.
Hi there, where are you? Oh, I'm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. My name is Joe. Louisiana, in a, as a general rule, is a very haunted place, uh, uh, and uh, it was many haunted cities, too. Oh, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Myrtle's Plantation is, a, is a really one of the haunted, most haunted houses in America. And uh, my wife and I wanted to uh, vacation there one year, but we really didn't have the money. You wanted, anyway, to, you wanted to go on vacation there? Oh, yeah. Many people... Uh, Many people stay in the Myrtle's plantation overnight just to see if they can get a glimpse of a ghost. Why, just out of curiosity, why do you think somebody would pay good money to get the you-know-what scared out of them? <laughs> human That's nature? A, yeah, it's, a, it's some sort of comment on, on human nature, isn't it? Well, go ahead. All right. Um, the house that my mother lives in was built in 1974, the year that I, that I was born. And... Um, when I was a small child, see my uh, my sisters and my brother, they they all told me this. When I was a small child, I had a, an imaginary friend that I called Sam, and I described him as a, a tall man wearing all black clothes with a black um, broad brimmed hat and long black hair. May I stop you and ask you a question? Sure. I've never I, I've heard so many stories about people, children that had imaginary friends. I never had one, and I've always wanted to ask. Your imaginary friend, mm -hmm. could you see your friend? Was your friend an invisible friend, and you just had this mental image of your friend? Did your friend talk to you? What kind of relationship was it? Well, uh, I was so young that I really don't remember. I was about three or four, and I, I was telling my, my uh, brother and sisters about this, and um, about them or anything. Mm -hmm. um, my sisters and my brother, my parents, and a couple of friends were sitting in the living room, and this man, uh, just as I described, my imaginary friend, uh, nobody saw him appear, but he started walking through the living room in front of everyone and started walking down the hall. Well, my dad gets up to look, you know, to see who's this man that's walking in the house, uh, figuring it to be, you know, a burglar or, you know, someone that just was on drugs or something. When he got to the uh, hall, the, the man wasn't there. Now, this happened eight times in front of at least three people each time. And he's never done anything that, uh, that you know, harmed the family or anything. But uh, my, they, they, my family all called him Sam because he was exactly as I had described my imaginary friend, Sam. Now, my wife, when she met me, she's a sensitive, and when she met me, um, she knew that something was in the house. And I haven't seen Sam since I was about 14, 15 years old. Yes. And she, when I called her tonight to say that, I was, that uh, you were doing this show, and for her to listen, she told me that she saw him go around the corner just the other day. Just walking, uh, you know, like when you see someone go around the corner, just catch the edge of them. Of course. Out of and the corner she, of your eyes. Or yeah. Thing. And she walked around the corner and he wasn't there. And she only, she didn't mention this to me until I, talk, until I talked to her tonight. And I wish she had because I'd like to know what's going on. Well, who knows? Maybe the next time you see Sam, it's going to be time for you to go. Yeah, maybe. Also, um, my sister, one of my sisters, she says, uh, she, she relates the story to me about waking up in the middle of the night and seeing, like, a Native American woman standing at the end of her bed that disappeared. And that's happened to her, she told me, uh, three or four times in that house. Well, when she moved to Germany, uh, she was in the Army, and she moved to Germany, she was stationed in uh, Stuttgart. She said that she saw the same Indian woman, and I talked to her uh, about six months ago, and she told me that she has seen this Indian woman everywhere she's gone. Not true. So she thinks it's probably a, a guardian spirit. That may well be, and it may be uh, that Sam is yours. Anyway, well, anyway uh, if you see Sam again, we're going to want to know about it.
All righty. All right. Uh, take care. I don't know about the black clothes. Meet Joe Black, huh? Perhaps there are entities that remain with us all our lives. Guide us through, and then when the time comes, uh, take us out. Most of the Rockies, you're on the air, hi. Yeah, you are. Well, it's starting out a little strange. <laughs> well, you asked for it. Yeah, you're right, I did. Well, anyway, I'm listening to you on 105.1 in Vegas. Yes, sir, KVBC. Well, this is this, a uh, story. I'm originally from Hawaii, and... Um, there's a whole bunch of stars, as you well know, Hawaii's a hot spot for things oh, like Oh, I this. do know that, yes. Yeah. And this happened while I was a teenager back in the uh, early 70s. And we were visiting family from the island of Kauai, which happens to be the oldest island in the chain of islands on Hawaii. Kauai, yes. And one of the spookiest. Well, as a child growing up, you know, I would hear uh, tons of stories from family, you know, about this sort of thing. It'll always happen in the evenings, and we'll get scared the next day when daylight's out. We're not scared anymore. Well, a bunch of our cousins, and my brother, and the cousins, and one friend, there was five of us in the car, that evening, traveling, just cruising around the island. And back in the 70s, there weren't many uh, street lights. There's not many still till today, but there's a right. lot more today. Right. And we decided to go out and uh, have some fun because, you know, we said, hey, let's, let's go... Um, call the ghost. One of the things they tell us in Hawaii that you never do is whistle in the nighttime. It's whistle? Like calling the spirit. You uh -huh. never do that. So we said, you know. So that's what you were going to do. And that's exactly what we were going to do. Figures. And we said, hey, let's, let's go down and the, and the, the place is called um, Spouting Horn. Spouting okay. Horn. And um, it's like the blowhole where the wave would come in and goes up um, underneath oh, the lava rock. Oh, and blows oh yes. Okay. Yes, I've seen it. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. And anyway, it was there, and it was like a, a dead end street. You know, you go up and then there's cane fields around there. So we went to the very end, and uh, we were out there whistling, calling the ghost. Oh, here, come here, ghost. Here, here, ghost. You mean, well, do the whistle. Yeah. <laughs> come on, ghost, ghost, you know. Like you were calling a dog. Like a dog. Because yeah. it said, don't whistle. And we said, ha, ha, that's just going to happen. <laughs> so we have this, this one cousin of ours, this little guy, and, and he likes to scare people all the time, so we thought we'd play a joke on him. And uh, we told him, now that night we didn't have much moonlight, but we could still see, you know, silhouettes. So there was some moon, obviously. And we told him, he says, okay, you know, there's a big old tree over there by um, the, the thinking, well, I know what these guys are going to do, man. They're going to dig out on him. So he says, okay, I'll do that. So he says, okay, go. So he walked, he disappeared, we couldn't see him. So we all jumped in the car and we took off. We, we went down the street. We're laughing, you know, we're going down the street. So I turn around to see, you know, what he's doing, you know, if I could see my cousin or what's going on, maybe he's running down after us. Sure. And I see like he's crouching over, standing position, but he's crouching over. So I'm laughing, he says, Oh look, look, look at him. What well, you know, what's he doing? And then my brother turns around and says, I don't know, I don't know what he's doing. So we had a ball, we went down and we drove like about a mile to the bottom of the hill towards the hotel, or that one hotel out in that area. And so we parked and we laughed and we were talking and we were saying how funny it is, how he likes to stir people and on and on. And so we finally decided, you know what, it's been a few minutes, let's go get him, the gag's over, you know, let's just go get him and get out of here, you know, sure. we had our laugh. But the driver cousin of mine he totally acted strange and when we said, okay, let, let's go get him, Henry, let's, you know, let's go up and get him. And he, he just, you know, laughed in, in a strange voice and says, no, no, we'll wait some more. So we started chuckled a little bit and said, okay, we'll go along with him. Well, we asked him to drive up a couple of times, and when it came to the third time, it was really weird, you know, it was, it was like our cousin talking strange voice. He wants to say, no, let him walk down to us. So my brother, being the oldest in the car at that time, says, well, look, if you're not going to turn around again, I'll kick you out of the car. I'll drive the car up. We'll get him. we walk home. Period. So then he agreed, okay, we'll go get him. So we're going back up the road, and as we get closer to the end, uh, we decided to turn the lights off and creep up on them. We shut the radio down, and we couldn't see them. So we sort of made the corner, and we were at the, the, the ledge, and, and, you know, the windows are down, of course. And we hear this um, Hawaiian chanting sort of music. Mm -hmm. No instruments to it. I know you know the music I'm talking about. I, I, of course I do. I've got about less than a minute. Okay. Well, anyway, we get there. We find them sitting on the end. 
And uh, so he's crying his heart out. You know, and, and we're starting to get scared now. And we're saying, you know, come on, let's go. You know, my brother was a football star, you know, in Hawaii at that time. And he said, let's go, let's get out of here. You know, joke's over. So we tried to, we tried to lift him. He couldn't lift him. And my cousin, like I said, small guy he was, he couldn't lift him. Well, when he finally got him in the car, we couldn't talk to him. Well, what we had to do to get him in the car now, I don't know if you're familiar with what, what the parents used to tell us then, if you have trouble, you swear and you urinate or whatever. Well, I try to do that when you're afraid, but we're swearing. We finally get him free. We're going down the hill, and we're trying to talk to him. He can't answer us, and we question why was he standing over and Real, real quick now. Okay. Well, as it turned out, he said he walked halfway across the, the road sat down and as we ran uh, ran towards the car and he tried to get up to go towards us yes. something held him down oh and that's why you that's we couldn't see him but we see the cross we see the spirit well after this was all over we went to visit our grandmother the next day because she's into this sort of stuff and very quick okay and she's seen the spirit behind him until today you know, that spirit still haunts them. He has to wear this stuff that my grandmother gave him. Wow. All right. From Hawaii, where lots of that kind of stuff happens. I threw a client about it that uh, about nine months ago, I talked to a few pretty tough persons that about something that uh, that happened to me. And I was thinking about pictures on definitely uh, UFO technology. And that's uh, yeah, really rare. Really rare when you talk about it. Uh, uh, mostly talk about things that are around.
old leads. And right, sure. Yeah, and the, just uh, just uh, bare wires. Right, and they, and they were all hanging there. Well, uh, we used to joke about uh, ghost mouths, and uh, uh, there were, of course, your, your creeps and everything else, and the uh, wind closing doors, and, uh, and uh, we just happened to be joking about ghosts that night, and, uh, and, and that doorbell rang. The doorbell rang. The doorbell rang. Without? The Without, ring. with no wire to take. There were no wires attached. To Are you head. sure you heard the I am. Am I sure I heard the doorbell? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty damn sure I heard that doorbell. Okay. Because this is uh, nothing like I've ever heard before. I mean, this it was the doorbell. And uh, and we both looked at each other. And uh, just a, I, it was a hair-raising thing. Uh, chills ran up and down my spine. Now, I never uh, believed in ghosts. And I, I really still don't. And... Uh, you know, uh, I, I, I can't believe there was, uh, uh... So you do have an explanation? Uh, no. No, no. No, I have no, I have no explanation. No explanation. But I still, I still can't, uh, I can't believe that, uh, you know, another entity was responsible for it. Although, you know, uh, you would have to be ignorant to believe that there was not something else out there. <laughs> uh, so... And precisely, sir. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, indeed. Indeed, you would have to be ignorant to imagine that it's all over, there's nothing out there. Well, there is something out there. And if you listen, as you listen during the night, you will become convinced of yourself if you have not by personal experience. Of course, all the questions are, what is it that's out there? And if it is us, where are we? Heaven, hell, somewhere in between. Why have we not gone elsewhere? Why do we remain? Wild card line, you're on the air. Uh, yes. This uh -huh. is uh, Frank in Freeport, Louisiana. Down in Louisiana again, yes, sir. And um, I'm a long-time Civil War collector of relics and uh, walked the battleground at Pleasant Hill for 25 years. And the doctor who owns the land, uh, we built a kind of extensive museum of mining artifacts. And all this time, for the last 25 years, uh, we began running into strange happenings on the battleground. This uh, old, old log house was used as a hospital during the battle and afterwards. And uh, we had the commander of the Civil War reenactment. He was going to stay in the old house overnight to be on the scene early in the morning, and he had a lantern in there, and his daughter had put up a uh, cot, and he was getting ready to go to bed, so he had to get up early and command the reenactment the next morning. Right. And, uh, of course, they had uh, Civil War reenactors everywhere, but uh, he said he was just getting late, and he wanted to go to sleep, and he said he didn't want to be disturbed. He told the rest of the reenactors to stay out. And all at once, this ragged Confederate came in with straggly hair and beard, said, it's your turn to take guard duty. And it irritated him real bad, and he said, I got to command the battle tomorrow. You go do the guard duty. He says, no, I'm tired. It's your turn. And that he laid down where onto the cot where his daughter was laying asleep, and he dissolved where into the cot where his daughter was. It shook him up pretty bad. Yeah, that would do it. That would definitely do it. Now, battlefields, uh, yes. Battle, okay. battle, battlefields have long been extremely haunted places for obvious reasons. Let me tell you one more if we have time. We had a New York boy that came down from up here, and I had hunted the battleground extensively, and the 173rd of New York had used the ditch there to fight hand-to-hand -hand combat until they were wiped out. So I, of course, used metal detectors to find the relics, and I'd hunted this ditch for about five years and found everything that could be found. He said, can I go with you? I would love to go with my kid folks. Now, he was from up north. Of course, I live in the south. <laughs> it's kind of unusual that way. So he went down there. He didn't know where he was. I didn't tell him where he was. And uh, he found a beautiful brass spur right next to the ditch where the 173rd New York were completely wiped out. So it was a hot day and we laid down in the ditch and 
I'll never get any of you folks that all been killed in the ditch we were laying in. <laughs> and all at once, our, he just jumped straight up out of the ditch like a something stuck him with a hot poker. And he said, something just passed over me. He said, I've got to get out of here. I've got to go. And I laughed. And he, I knew he didn't know where we were. So I said, oh, John, just lay back down. Just because all your kin folks all got killed right where you're laying. It's no reason to get up there. He jumped out of the ditch, sat down in the old road. Uh, I'll have to have a little fun with him. Uh, John. Southern fun. This is Southern fun. Yeah. And so I said, John, you just sat down in the old Civil War road. I said, pretty soon a caisson pulled by horses and a cannon will come roaring down the road. But don't get out of the way. It'll just pass on through you. Well, he was thoroughly shook because he was really nervous already and had something bothering him continuously. And uh, that, he didn't know what to say to that. So I had to pull his legs a little more. And I said, Pretty soon you'll hear the bugles blow, and it'll be time to leave. And he was so upset by then that he was at, we were a mile from the car on the road, and he couldn't contain himself. He said, something's here with me. I've got to go. I've got to go. And I said, no, oh, John, wait till the bugles blow. The coon hunter blew up one of these old fox horns. <laughs> and John left that woods, leaving the trail of smoke all the way to the car. And I walked him out, out up there, and he was scared to death sitting on the hood. And he said, something was in that ditch with me. He said, I know it, I know it. I said, and you couldn't even let me get in the car. He said, you had it locked. Uh, well, we got a real fun thing out of that. Yes, well, now I've had a little taste of a southern sense of humor. Uh, Dre, his whole family was killed in the ditch. And he felt something pass directly over him. And you didn't tell. And you were having fun with him. Great sense of humor. Great. Maybe they just did those things for granted down there. Houston. Houston, the Rockies are on the air. Hello. Hello there. Hello? Yes, hello. Oh, it's me. Uh, only you'd know that for certain, but it sounds like you. Hi, Art. Hi. Uh, I have to go to All right, where are you? I'm in Texas, Austin. Austin, right? Right now, but the ghost, the resident ghost, was living with me on Long Island. And uh, my son was about three or so, and he wanted, we had a pull-down attic door, and he wanted the Jeep I had hidden for him for Christmas yes. up there. I said, how do, you, you know, how do you know what's up there? He said, well, Irving takes me up there. Irving. Irving. I said, who's Irving? He says, he visits me at night. And I said, well, how do you get up in the attic? And he pulled the door down, and he said, no, we float up through the ceiling. Through the ceiling? Through the ceiling. And uh, in days to come, Irving had taken him to where Irving lived, which is, was a box of bones in the ground. A box of bones in the ground? In the ground. Through the ceiling to get to a box of bones in the ground? Yes. Okay. So, uh, in days to come, we had an occasion to walk through the community cemetery to see the Memorial Day Parade. And as we're walking through the cemetery, he pulls at me, he says, Mommy, Mommy, there's where Irving lives. And I go over to the where he showed me, yes. and it was Irving Riggs. Oh, my God. So, you mean it said it right there? It said it right there on the gravestone. So I had, um, I worked for 30, so... Yeah, oh, that's, excuse that's me, hospital. but you know, this really sucks. I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't like graves. I want to be cremated. I don't like bones. I don't like things buried under the ground. And the last thing in the world I'd want is to be in a box with bones and Irving. Well, that, that was Irving's bones. But I asked him, I said, does it, you know, weren't you afraid? He says, no, Irving talks to me. No? He said he was afraid at first. But uh, now, you, there was a question earlier this evening. You said to somebody, does this child see the person? Yes, yes, oh yes. Well, I have that answer for you. And it is? Well, I worked uh, for years with a girl by the name, whose last maiden name was Riggs. So I told her, I said, Edna, uh. do, do you have any ancestors by the name of Irving? She says, yes, a great grandfather. So I told her the story. And, uh, in quite a few years to come then, she said her aunt had died, and uh, she went over to help her take the stuff out of, 
uh, out of the clear the attic out, and a picture fell out of a box she was carrying down from the attic, and she asked her other aunt, "Who is this?" Yes. And her other aunt said, "That's your know, great grandfather Irving." And so she gave me the picture. Yes. And now my son's in his teens, and he hasn't seen Irving, and Irving has just, you know, uh, turned water on, and we always say, oh, it's Irving. Things have fallen off the wall, there's footsteps. And uh, so when I, I came home from work and I put the picture on the bulletin board by the phone, my son comes running in from work or something, and he grabs the phone to call his girlfriend. And he stops short, he hangs the phone up, he says, Mommy, where did you get that picture? Who's that picture of? I said, I don't know. I said, who did it look? I said, oh, God. So there's not much question about the fact that, at least in your son's case, he sure saw Irving. And Irving was a real person, a real ghost. <laughs> oh, man. We, oh, man, what a story. We put a face to Irving. I wanted yeah, to tell well, you this story. Better, better a face, better a face than bones. <laughs> oh, I think man. he was better looking uh, in the picture. Uh, no doubt. All right, my dear, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, no, no, thank you. <laughs> I don't like that one. I don't like that one at all. Can you imagine being taken in the night by a spirit? To the place underground where the body was last is buried. To spend time with the spirit there. No, no, thank you. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello? Yes, hello. Hi, how you doing? I don't know. Uh, I was doing better earlier. How are you doing? Oh, fine. I'm calling from Sacramento. Yes, sir. Home. Yes. I, uh, I was privileged to live in a house that my grandfather purchased. Um, got in the 30s. He bought the land and he built it up. He built it by hand and basically by cementing the cement mason. And um, over the years he traveled during the war. My grandmother, they travel around, you know, doing uh, contracts for the government, building, you know, air bases and stuff. Well, they finally planted themselves on this piece of property. And my grandmother wouldn't move. Well, my grandfather passed away in the uh, late 70s, and I came home and leave and saw him. And the night he passed away, we talked. Then my grandmother passed away in the uh, late 80s. And me and my girlfriend um, decided, well, we'll move into the house. Now, this house was built by a bunch of drunken cement masons. So there was add-on, add-on, add-on. <laughs> a bunch of drunken uh, 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 masons? Yeah, cement masons. Cement you know, masons. masons. And my dad and my uncle, they built, they made the bricks by hand. My grandfather loved cement. Yeah. And he, he would cuss every time he said that house I built, I made 100,000 of these bricks. Well, over time, the house, we, I moved in, I was a nurse, and I worked at night, and, and I lived in South Sacramento. And over time, the area deteriorated, but the plot of land we had in the house was there. Right. When we first moved in, things would start to happen. Uh, a light switch, we had these distinctive light switch. My grandfather was a scrounger, and if he could get it from the military base, he'd get it. These lights would go click, click, right, click, click. And we'd be sitting in the living room, and there was a lot of stuff left over from there, but you'd sit there, and you hear a click, click, and the light bounced bounce from the back bathroom would come on. Mm -hmm. The door was kind of jar, and then you, while well, it was flush, click, click, the light would go off. <laughs> if these small things went on, you'd get cigar smoke. My grandfather was a avid cigar smoker. Listen, sir, uh -huh. I'm going to interrupt your story, and we're going to finish it after the break. Is that all right? Okay. All right, stay right, click, click. Uh, I don't no. know. If I saw a skeleton, I'd be going the other way. But you chased the uh, I guess. Now, is that a rational thing to do? Well, at the time, I guess it, it, it must have been. I don't know. Well, e either that or you weren't rational at that moment. Either way, go ahead. Well, anyways, it uh, uh, ducked around the corner of this, this building, yeah. and I, I got up there next to the corner of the building, and it took off back the other way. So in the process, process of uh, uh, getting my motorcycle turned around again, now there's two people standing there that weren't there before. And uh, the girl had uh, long black hair. She had like on a, a white gown, and she had real white skin and wire rimmed glasses. Uh, this guy that was standing next to her had on like a, 
a brown trench coat, uh, like a really old looking, uh, old timey suit, brown suit with a silly uh, shirt and kind of a, you know, like a scissor cut haircut. Yes, sir. He had a cane. And I stopped the bike and this girl reached out and grabbed Roxanne's hand, my girlfriend's hand. Yes. And she squeezed him so hard it hurt her for a week. And three times she said, Mama told us not to come out tonight. Three times she said that. Right. And the course of events, you know, all going on. I'm asking him, what, what's this thing up there going? You know, run it. And the guy never said a word. He just stood there, you know, looking at us. And uh, we, we rolled off to go try to catch this thing, and it, it just poof, disappeared. Mama told us not to come out tonight, huh? Yes, she said that three times. What do you think you encountered? Well, I got to talking to us. Uh, this one guy that I I knew that was kind of into, into crazy stuff like that, you know, and he told me we encountered something of the supernatural. Crazy? I, I don't know about uh, crazy. And not easily explained, perhaps, but I don't, I don't know about crazy. The one that uh, still bothers me the most tonight is the box with bones. As a child, Going with your play friend to the, the box with the bones. Underground. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Eric. This is Pat in Minneapolis. Yes, hi, Pat. How are you doing today? Well, um, that's an interesting question. It deserves more time than I have right now to answer it. Uh, what's on your mind? Well, I wanted to tell you the story of my encounter. All right. I work for a news station, and several years ago I was at a different station down in Florida. A radio station? Television. Oh, television, okay. Television yeah. news. And one morning, very early, I had to go in and I was supposed to meet someone to go out of town. Yeah. So I walked into the building around 3 o'clock in the morning, right. and there was no one else in the building. And I started getting all my stuff together to head out, waiting for the other person to show up. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. We're telling ghost stories this night. It's called Ghost to Ghost AM. We'll get right back to it. I wonder if some cruise ships are on it. One would think so. Uh, there certainly are some planes that are haunted. Here's my caller once again, sir. Please uh, continue. Oh, hi. Hi. Back. Yeah, before I go on, I just want to, uh, the trading company, I found them very amicable and very easy to deal with. I will purchase many more things from them. Thank you. You're right. They are. Yeah. Uh, where were we at? We were at uh, my oh, my grandfather's house. Yes. Yeah. He was a really character, but as I say, he loved his cement, and he would get friends to do things for him and build things. And the house started off as I, with a one room, and then they added on. Well, over a period of time after they passed away and my girlfriend moved in, Things, you know, started happening, you know, cigar smoke, you could smell it. You could, you know, fried chicken. Lights would come on and off. Um, you'd be sitting there and you'd get a whiff of my grandmother's perfume. Or you'd get a cold breeze by your head. Nothing demonic. It was all, it was fun. It made you feel good. And my girlfriend would be home alone and she'd be sitting in the garage room, which was my, where my grandmother spent most of her time. She'd say, hey, my he's back. <laughs> and she'd say, She's in here, she's turned the TV on and off a couple times, and she'd laugh, but um, then things would start to happen. He, my grandfather had a cement shed where he did all his work for his pots and stuff, and we were one night sitting in a bed, we kept hearing this noise. And it was a, it was a cement mixer going around and around, oh my. and we got it, went outside. Of course, it's not there anymore, but we kept hearing, and then you hear shovels. Yep. Don't you realize, though, the potential horror that you're talking about, I, in, in other words, dying, being so attached, I can be, yeah. I, I can understand being attached to the work you have done, the stone yeah. work you have done, the house you live in, the area you're in, yeah. your plot of land, whatever it is, I can understand that, but, but, but the hell of being forever more confined, unseen to roam in these uh, places, um, it's just, it's horrible to contemplate. 
Yeah, well, I understand that, and I felt for him. So we would talk to him. I'd be sitting there working, and I'd say, how are you doing? And I worked in his office. I, lived there. I was actually lucky to live for about three years. And the final kind of chapter in all this, my girlfriend and we were having a bad night, and we woke up suddenly. And she got up, and I got up, we walked outside in the living room. All the chairs were upside down. The property was being sold. So they, I think, were upset that they were losing their house. Because this was the hub of our family. Right. No, that's right. Oh, no. no. I understand the chairs were upside down. Right. Yeah. And so then, finally, I was tasked. Kind of, you know, they, my girlfriend was taking a, ba a shower, a bath. She felt the door open, and then she felt her hand on her, or her back. That's it. She got up, went out, dried off, got up. Well, the light went on, toilet well, flushed. There it is again. I got tasked to cleaning out the pump house, we called it. And there was a lot of stuff in there. And the, the, we were selling the property, so we had to clean up the, you know, what's left over. Right. And this is kind of emotional because. I cleaned it all out, and I was throwing my grandmother with a pack rat. Everything. Well, I got done finished cleaning it out, and there was this shelf that I had that had been cleaned off, but it had just been sitting there. Right. And I went out, and finally to get the last load, and I looked up, and there were these two cars. They were those little die-cast hot metal cars. Oh, yes. The Porsche. Right. And, Whoa, that's interesting. They were just sitting there with a red one and a green one. And I looked at them, where did these come from? Well, I picked them up when I took them in to my girlfriend. I said, wait, you mess with me again? You know, because we used to play tricks on each other. She said, no. And she kind of turned kind of white. Where did you get those? I said, out in the shed. I thought I felt something out there. Well, the car turned out to be my father's when he was a kid. And uh, I guess my grandmother wanted him to have them because we were throwing all this stuff away. And they turned it back up. <laughs> my dad kind of got curious. He said, I haven't seen these in 30 years. Unfortunately, the property was sold and things moved on, and I, I think they're still there. I don't think they're happy. I hope, you know, there was a lot of other things that went on, but it wasn't an evil thing. It was very, very, very strange to be there. I understand. And I really enjoyed it. Um, it well, I've enjoyed your story, and I, I'm going to amplify on it a little bit. Thank you very, very much. If you're very young, you won't uh, comprehend what I'm about to say. But um, as you get older, a place that you have built yourself, a place that you have designed yourself, your own property, your own place, would and does carry such a very, very strong, if there is some sort of existence, be it heaven or hellish after, after this life, you would not easily nor perhaps ever, in, in the real horror of thinking about it, detach yourself from this place that you were so connected to, that you so loved, that you knew every cranny and crook uh, of, that you, you loved, you know, your, your place, your home, that you remain there. But that's quite a prospect to consider, isn't it? First time caller line, you're on the air. Good morning. Hi, my name is Bob. I'm from Alameda, California. Hello, Bob. Yeah, and um, I live on an island. It's called Alameda, and the significance of that will come up later. All right. But I'm a commercial pilot, and in January of 1998, I was working on building hours, building cross-country hours. Right. So I do you fly. fly do you fly uh, big jets? No, I fly uh, small little airplanes. I'm still building up hours. Going to do my certified flight instructor rating. Gotcha. But off of that, we'll go up to, uh, I was going to fly up to Ukiah. I flew up there and visited with my friends, and it got kind of late. So I started to fly back, and it was about 11.30 at night. And as I left the airport area, it was about 3,000 feet. And uh, all of a sudden, it got really, really cold in the cockpit. Man, this is real cold. In the cockpit? Yeah, in the cockpit of this little 172 Cessna. Mm. So I reached up and, and closed the vents, and I pulled on the heater, and it, it just stayed really cold. And I didn't think much of it. And I, I listened to a station called 960. It's an old 40 station. I had that going on, and they were playing the old music. And all of a sudden, over my headsets, I hear, check your six, boy. And I was all by myself in the cockpit. And the uh, communications radio, I didn't even have that on. Yes. So I turned around and looked behind me, check your six, look at your six o'clock position. Right. I turned around, 
and all of a sudden there's just this kind of glowing green light getting closer and closer. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, oh my god. Yeah. So I, uh, what was the voice like? It, it just sounded like some old sporty voice, you know. Check your six. Yeah, check your six, boy, is what he said. Yeah. And I turned around, and the light was getting closer. And so I go to turn and push forward, and the yoke wasn't moving. And uh, these little planes aren't equipped with autopilot. <laughs> and this thing was not, you know, not pitching down and not turning or anything. You couldn't change anything. I couldn't. I could move after that. And uh, all of a sudden, the lights dimmed in the cockpit. I'm getting real scared. I can hear you. <laughs> yeah. And so then I kind of get fixated on on this thing coming up behind me. And as it gets closer, it had a, probably another, you know, I'd say 60 or 70 knots on me. It was creeping up, and then it went around on my right side and came up yeah, to yeah. about my 3 o'clock position. Yes. <clears throat> and I'm looking at it, and it's a huge flying boat with one of the old uh, Pan Am type clippers had pulled up alongside me. You've got to be kidding. Oh, God, I'm not. I wish I was, because it's really scared the heck out of you me. You swear as, as, a, as a pilot to be, this is true? I can't lie. All right, all right, all right go ahead. I don't, I don't tell people about this, because they'll think I'm crazy, but I figured I'll go ahead and call. Anyway, this thing pulls up beside me, and it starts to creep in, and, and you know, I'm, I'm really frantically trying to get this stick to move, and I just look over, and all of a sudden, I, I just see this face in the cockpit window, and this thing's huge, you know, four big radial engines. Yeah. And uh, the guy kind of gives me a wave, and then he turns off, pulls away, and then all of a sudden, it just kind of vanished, you know? And then I could start to hear things again, and I could hear the radio again. So I made it back to Oakland Airport, where I'm based out of. Yes. And I landed there, and uh, my mom had bought me this book a couple weeks earlier, and it was called... Uh, I got it right here. It's the Pacific Pioneers and American Story. And I just was curious when I was looking through it. There's one thing called that. It's an M130 Philippine Clipper. It's a Martin flying boat. And it uh, had crashed on July, or on, yeah, it was January 21st, 1943. It crashed up in the Ukiah area. And I was like, wow, that's, that's really amazing. Maybe that was the same one I saw. And then, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't think much of it after that. And I was riding my bike up at the old Naval Air Station in Alameda, and this, it turned out that Alameda was the base for the Pan American Company for their uh, Pacific flight. Yes, sir. Yeah, I could not believe it, but yeah, it happened. So, you were, you, you had a mid-air encounter with a ghost plane. Yeah, and in ATC, I, you know, I queried them on my way in. I said, do you have someone, have you, seen any planes around me on your radar and they said no and I, I didn't really want to press the thing I was kind of worried I might have a phone number to call when I got back from yeah, the definitely, definitely you would want to tell that story no no so, so I kind of say keep it under your hat and all your millions of listeners too <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that sir yeah thanks a lot thank you <laughs> but what does that tell us what hints uh, do we do we derive from that story with respect to uh, things that are gone, dead, gone? Was it the plane itself that was in some slip of time or dimension suddenly there again? Were the occupants of that plane that had crashed? Oof, what a story. Check your six. If you want. Used to the Rockies, you're on the air. Yeah, Art. Yes, hello. Oh, hey, Art. Uh, nice to talk to you. Uh, my name is Rod, and I'm calling from Hayworth, Illinois, and uh, I'm listening to you from uh, WJBC here in Bloomington. Yes, sir. And uh, I have a story that's kind of ironic, uh, what this guy was just saying uh, right ahead of me. The red eyes, you mean? Yeah. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the story I have is uh, a friend of mine was telling me this just a few years ago, and uh, I guess it probably happened within the last 10 years or so. And uh, it happened in a uh, little small town just uh, south of where I'm calling right now. But uh, I guess there was a, uh, a family that lived in this house. And uh, there was a mom and a dad and, you know, three little kids. And I guess they were pretty young from what I hear. But uh, I 
gift one evening, you know, after the kids had gone to bed, and the parents were just sitting down watching TV. Yes. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, these three kids had come uh, <clears throat> tearing down the stairs, uh, screaming, you know, Mommy, Mommy. Uh, we just saw we saw some red eyes upstairs. You know. Red eyes. Yeah, uh, we're scared. You know, and uh, well, of course the parents, you know, they they really didn't take it seriously. I guess they just kind of, well, you know, it's okay. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> you know, just try to go back to sleep. I guess they went up, checked everything out, reassured the kids and everything that everything was going to be fine and everything. And uh, so they went to sleep. I guess uh, it's kind of a tragic tale, but uh, I guess a few days later, uh, the house burned down. The and, house uh, burned down. Yeah, and uh, I guess these three little kids were uh, killed, you know, in the in the house fire. And uh, so I don't know. I just thought that was, that was pretty strange. Well, it is strange, sir. Thank you. And again, red eyes. I, I told you, red eyes. Red eyes are not good. Red eyes are not good. All right, listen, two things, folks. Number one, you may now begin checking my website because as he receives them, uh, Keith Rowland, my webmaster, is putting the ghost photographs that you're sending, uh, the good ones, up on the website. Now, we'll see what little section he has prepared for that. Uh, but no doubt you'll find a link on the front page. If you have a ghost photograph, a spirit photograph, or a demon photograph, this is the night we are not only collecting, but immediately posting them as we do Ghost to Ghost AM. Now, you may send them to webmaster at artbell.com. That's webmaster at artbell.com. A quick Terrence McKenna update for you. Terrence is now away with his... Uh, lady friend for a couple of days uh it's a location unknown and i feel quite confident that uh, next week we're going to talk a bit with terence mckenna he uh has a rather grim prognosis with a malignant brain tumor in his frontal lobe area uh, but he believes he is not doomed those are his words i spoke with him on the phone he said i am not I don't feel doomed. Uh, he is a unique individual, and I imagine he has a, perhaps a different outlook on life right now, something I would love to explore with him on the air, and, and I think we will in this next week. At any rate, uh, coming back soon with more Ghost to Ghost AM from the High Desert. If Greer is one serious guy, he's very serious. Uh, Yeah, that's fine. I'm